Welcome to the show. I'm your host, Katie Sill, Academic Advisor for the University of Alaska Southeast Sitka Campus. I'm really excited about this week's episode because I got to sit down with one of my favorite professors at UAS. Amy Samuel is the Program Director for the Medical Assisting Program, and we work together to advise students as they explore their future careers in healthcare. Don't know what a medical assistant is? Don't worry. By the end of this episode, you will. Hi, I'm Amy Samuel. I am a Associate Professor of Health Sciences and the Program Director for our UAS Medical Assisting Program. Now, Amy is a little different from some of our other instructors here in Sitka because she doesn't actually live in Sitka. She just comes to visit. So today's very special since she's here in town. Amy, can you talk a little bit about the setup that you have in terms of traveling around the state? Sure. Our program reaches all over Alaska, and so I travel to the students for the clinicals, or they come in to our community partner campuses, and they practice their skills. So our program is hybrid, where they have a blend of online work and in-person skills in a shortened time, and so I go to them to assess their skills. And what kind of places do you usually visit on your circuit around the state? Well, it is a UAS program. So we have University of Alaska Southeast partner campuses. That would be here in Sitka, in Juneau, and in Ketchikan. And we also have a great collaborative agreement with Kenai at KPC, Kenai Soldotna area that would have students all over South Central Peninsula area. And then also just a new campus brought on this fall was Kodiak Campus. So Amy and I are going to play a little game with you. We want to challenge you to see if you know what medical assistants can do versus what nurses can do. So we have nine tasks or skills that these healthcare workers can do. And I want you to think to yourself, can a medical assistant do this or is this something only a nurse can do? So what's the first skill, Amy? All right. Number one is manage medical records. Number two is process insurance and facilitate authorizations. Number three. Draw blood and run laboratory tests. Number four, prepare and administer medications and injections. Number five, take blood pressure and other vital signs. Number six, bookkeeping and managing financial transactions. Number seven, specimen collection. Number eight, help patients and providers navigate healthcare systems. And number nine, diagnose medical conditions and prescribe medications or treatments. So all of these things are common tasks that healthcare workers do. But what we want to know is, do you know what a medical assistant is and what kinds of things that they do? For those of you who are keeping score, Amy, which of these things can medical assistants do and which of these things can they not do? Medical assistants are trained to do all of these things with the exception of diagnose medical conditions, prescribe medication, or treatments. So that means that medical assistants are working not only on the clinical side of healthcare, where they're working directly with patients, drawing blood, taking blood pressure, helping with basic medical procedures, but they're also helping in the administrative side as well. So can you talk a little bit more about the role of a medical assistant in the healthcare system in general? Yeah, medical assistants are multi-task trained health professionals, and we really are trained for outpatient care, so you will most likely see medical assistants in an outpatient setting. That would include doctor's offices, clinics, urgent care settings. Some clinics have hospital-based offices, so they may work in a hospital, but in the outpatient setting. So primarily patients who can walk in and walk out or ambulatory care settings versus an inpatient nursing home or inpatient hospital. It seems to me that a lot of us who go to doctor's offices for our checkups and treatment may have already encountered a medical assistant but not actually known it. Medical assistants work under the scope of a licensed provider such as an MD, a medical doctor, or a mid-level provider such as a nurse practitioner or a PA. And so we fall under the direction of what they would like to delegate to us. We're not independently licensed like a nurse or a CNA is where we have a state license. We have a national credential. And so the provider will delegate to us within our scope of practice. A credentialed medical assistant can do those duties as delegated. We train our students to introduce themselves as a medical assistant, basically telling the patient, I'll be your student medical assistant today. 
And one of the cool duties that medical assistants were doing here in Alaska this time last year was helping out with vaccine distribution. Can you tell me a little bit about that experience? Yeah, of course, it it varied in community on how medical assistants were utilized. Several of our students, myself included, helped with those community health screenings and COVID drive throughs where they got their swabs, packaging those samples and sending them to the lab, processing them, identifying the patient and making sure the patient is appropriately matched with their specimen. Some also helped with the vaccine clinics and distribution of vaccines when those came out last year. I know anybody listening to the things that are going on at the state level, they really just hear a lot of demands for nurses. How can medical assistants help fill those needs for health care in the state of Alaska? Medical assistants are the right hand people because in outpatient care, we do have such a wide variety of training that if somebody calls in in the front or somebody gets pulled to a different area in the back, that medical assistant has training in all of those areas and can just jump in and help with facilitating what needs to be done for the day. So they are kind of in a way like a Swiss army knife where they can <laughs> they can do all kinds of different tasks and jobs to keep the clinic moving, keep people from having long waiting times in the waiting rooms or being able to receive their payments even because we're working on the billing side as well in some cases, right? We're really patient advocate and provider advocate. We're the in-between to help keep things going and moving and make everybody's experience, you know, more smooth and getting those patients' needs met and the provider's needs met and facilitating those as their advocate. So when I'm working with students as the academic advisor who is listening to the student tell me, I want to be a nurse, I want to work in healthcare, I always try to slow them down and say, okay, when you imagine your work in healthcare, What kind of setting do you imagine it in? Are you in a doctor's office? Are you in the ER? Are you in the hospital? Are you in a clinic? Are you helping in long-term care? And kind of facilitate that conversation to really explore whether or not medical assisting might be a good fit for them versus nursing. And a lot of times the students don't even know the difference between medical assisting or nursing. So in those conversations, I try to give them an idea about what the different lifestyles are like in terms of workload. Can you help elaborate on what that might look like for a medical assistant versus a nurse? Absolutely. I came from the profession. I I am a medical assistant. I carry a medical assisting credential and I do often fill in at clinics to keep my skills up and to keep current with what's going on. I feel like the benefits are nine to five or eight to five. And usually there is some evening clinical hours in urgent care or weekend hours, but it's not an overnight thing. You're not working 12 hour shifts. Also, I really enjoyed having those relationships that you may not see in a hospital where you see a patient once and then not again because they're done. Developing those family relationships, seeing kids grow up and helping them with their health care needs throughout their life is very rewarding. Now, you mentioned that the medical assisting lifestyle seems to be a little more family friendly. And I believe that's because a lot of the students that you work with are adults who have families and are looking for a change in their career or looking for a way to get into healthcare. Can you tell me a little more about the student demographics for your program? Yeah, we have had definitely people who've come through who are a little bit older. They've raised their kids. Their kids are going back to school. Now's a good time for them to consider finishing their school or going on to get training where they can work. We also have students who change careers mid-career. Maybe they've been in a field and they really want to do something different. And so they come through the program to retrain and get those skills in healthcare. Also, UAA and Anchorage can only take so many students every year. So a lot of times I work with those students who are ready to go to nursing school, but maybe nursing school isn't ready for them. Or maybe it's not a good time for them to do nursing school because of lifestyle changes that would need to be made in order to accommodate the rigor of nursing school. And in this way, they can still work in healthcare as a medical assistant, and it actually benefits them on their nursing school application, right, Amy? They do. They get an extra point for having that healthcare experience or for completing a program. Several of our students already work in healthcare, either as a front office person or maybe they are an uncredentialed medical assistant or a CNA who's been trained to do a few skills in addition to their CNA training. Sometimes that experience from healthcare really benefits the student because they have stories and they have experience with the topics that we're talking about. 
And for them, that really solidifies their learning. So you do get extra credit on that nursing application. You kind of touched on this before, but let's really focus in on the format. How is the medical assisting program at UAS a little more flexible? Flexible is a great word to describe our program, and I think that's really one of the gems of our program. It is academically robust. It's a challenging program. It's a one-year program that you will definitely have to give up some of your free time to do the course. So definitely need to be prepared for that academic rigorous format. However, we do have a lot of students who will either take classes one at a time and can still be successful and graduate with their certificate. And so for them, that's a better schedule and they're able to manage and balance. So we work with each student individually to kind of come up with an academic plan that works with their schedule, their lifestyle, their work, and they can still be successful in their program. In the beginning, students are required to do some basic general education prerequisite classes. And once you've accomplished those prerequisite courses, you're able to then start taking the medical assisting clinical and the medical assisting administrative courses. Can you talk a little bit about what those courses are like in terms of when the students meet with you versus the work that they're doing independently. Sure. The administrative courses, administrative procedures one and two, are completely online. And so all of those assignments are done online or over the phone or maybe in a Zoom meeting, but we don't have scheduled meeting times at this point. They're able to flexibly do their learning when it works into their schedule. For the clinical classes that they might take at the same time, that is six weeks of the online piece where they're doing homework and quizzes and simulations, electronic health records, all of the online concepts that they need as a foundation before we get together for a clinical skills intensives. So that is four days where we work together one-on-one or in a group and we work through those skills that they have to check off on. So as an example, we might be covering vital signs for the week. And so online, they're going to do homework regarding what normal vital signs are, what the vital signs are themselves, normal expected values, And they're going to do a simulation where they go in on the computer and attach a blood pressure cuff or attach an oxygen monitor to a finger and take temperatures. They do those in a simulated environment. They do a quiz and some other supportive assignments. And then we get together at that six-week part and we actually work with the equipment. We put it on the finger. We pump up the blood pressure cuff. We take temperatures. So this blending kind of allows them to do the background information that they need to prepare to be performing those skills when we get together. After that, we do another six weeks of the online and come together. So they meet twice a semester for four days, and it's in those different areas, Juno, Kenai, Ketchikan, that we meet for those clinical skills. And what happens if a student is living outside of those communities you just mentioned? How do they still participate in the in-person portion of the class? They are required to be in person. It's mandatory that they do come to those clinical skills labs because we have certain skills that must be observed by an instructor and performed in person. So they are required to be in person. Students are eligible to come to any of the lab that's closest to them. So if they live at Metlakotla and we're having a Ketchikan site for clinical skills labs, they can come to Ketchikan for those four days and be able to complete those skills labs. We also have a little bit of funding available due to a grant that we've received, and so we can sometimes support students financially to get to the nearest area if there isn't a clinical site that's closest to them. Well, that's wonderful because I know that some students who are listening or students-to-be who are listening might be thinking, oh, well, I don't live there, so that means I can't do it. But really, there's a lot of opportunities for them to be able to find their way to the sites. And you actually have to carry some interesting equipment with you whenever you travel to these sites. Can you tell us a little bit about your security experiences at airports? Yeah, in addition to... uh you know, all of the sites that we have, I do travel to the students and I carry with me the supplies that we need to check off. So if we happen to be checking off on pediatrics, they will find a baby doll in my suitcase. Or if we're checking off on drawing blood and finger sticks, they will find a fake arm with fake blood in my suitcase. So hasn't been too much of an issue so far. But I'm sure the TSA agents have some questions when (laughs) they do see those things. Yes, yes. 
So all of these skill sets are really setting students up not only to work as medical assistants, but if they wanted to continue their education beyond medical assisting, what kinds of things could they do? Well, we did talk about you get an extra point on the nursing. So if nursing and inpatient care is directly what your goal is, then you could certainly get some extra training and credit on that nursing application. It is a great entry to healthcare to get you exposed to different situations. And I've had a few students go get their clinical hours for being a PA in working as a medical assistant and getting those 5,000 hours in. And then they've gone to PA school. They got paid while they were doing that hands-on care. I do have a student right now who graduated last year and she's in medical school in Oregon. So it's a nice stepping stone introduction, exposes you to some of the entry level experiences and patient care on the outside that you could definitely use in the future. And what happens if the student goes through the medical assisting program, works as a medical assistant for a little while and says, "Mm, maybe I don't want to work with patients so much. I want to go into the administrative side. What kind of route could they take then? They will see the whole experience of the office, so they'll be familiar with the flow. They could certainly go into an administrative role. They could possibly do a supervisory role. They could even go into health information management or other medical programs that don't necessarily work directly with patients. So that is one of the key things with medical assisting is you can kind of focus your area. I would say nine and a half out of 10 students prefer the clinical side. They like the hands-on, but it's very flexible and you do learn all of the skills, so a lot of opportunity to expand. We have a few more minutes here, so I kind of wanted to explore something along the lines of common misunderstandings in terms of medical assisting. So when you tell people what you do and you explain the program to students, what are some of the assumptions that they make or some of the things that you find yourself explaining and re-explaining or trying to clarify? Well, as you touched on earlier, a lot of people think that anybody who works clinically is a nurse, and we are a healthcare team. We all work together for the benefit of patients, and we all serve a role. So while there may be nurses in the medical office in a clinical side, there's also medical assistants. So I think that's a key misunderstanding is that we only are the one that greets the patient at the front or only the one that takes your copayment or your insurance card. So that is one misunderstanding for sure that we work only in the front. We definitely work in the back and most of our students actually end up there versus working in the front. How many students are typically in your program at what time, at one time, excuse me, and is there any room for growth at this point? We have a cohort that starts every fall, and that cohort would include students in multiple different areas. So we would have up to six students in one location, possibly even up to eight. Relatively small numbers, you're getting to work with a partner, you're getting to work with the instructor. And even though I'm the academic advisor, you do work very closely with the students in the medical assisting program, sometimes doing even more advising than me. So what are some of the things that you would say to a prospective student or somebody who listening now is thinking, well, maybe I want to do medical assisting? What's some advice that you could give to them about getting started and what to expect? Yeah, we have a rigorous program. So being confident in your writing and math skills are definitely important. That's why we have those prerequisites built in. After the academic piece, students will do a practicum where they work in a doctor's office or clinic. We place them there as part of a class and they do 180 hours where they're working side by side in a clinic or doctor's office, hands on to get that patient experience. So that's a real benefit before they finish the program is that they can go out and practice what they've learned We also have an associate's degree, the health science associate's degree that has a medical assisting emphasis. So if students are interested in getting their medical assisting certificate, but then going on to continue their educational piece, they're able to take a few extra classes and go on to have an associate's degree as well. So academically, they could even continue after the certificate. I hope you all enjoyed learning about medical assisting. If you would like to know more about the program, please don't hesitate to reach out. Amy and I are more than happy to answer your questions, and you can find our contact information at uas.alaska.edu. On the next episode, I'm going to continue my exploration of healthcare opportunities at UAS. It's going to be all about nursing, and I can't wait. Until next time, take care.